Okay. Well, um, today's topic is going to be number theory. And by that, I, I mean like the sort of field of math that deals more with divisibility and digit, digits, basically. And you'll, you'll see when you see the types of problems that we're going to be working with. So um, today, I think I wanted to cover factorials, divisibility, modulo, digits, GCD, LCM, and spaces. All right, so first, factorials, and it's really just, um, they're, they're just, just a notation for the product of all the positive integers less than or equal to n, like this, and, and it's just denoted by an exclamation point, so n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, all the way down to 1. And basically, um, I talked about this last class, it's the number of ways to order n objects. And a lot of times in problems, in number theory problems involving factorials at least, try to keep track of the number of factors of 5, as this is going to be the number of zeros that the factorial ends with. And um, it will also be divisible by all the prime numbers less than n, but not by any prime number greater than n, which can be sort of useful when you need to factor, or when you're looking for these factors at least. And on the topic of factoring, um, a cool thing that is very important to know is that uh, we can always write a number as basically the product of the powers of primes. For example, we can write 12 as 2 squared times 3, where each of the terms are primes and they're raised to some power, and it's just 1. And this is true for literally any number, as this actually etc. Right. And basically, um, what you need to know is that if a number, um, let's just call it k or something, like, you know, is a product of um, of basically a lot of primes to a lot of different powers. Basically, the p1, p2, p3, and so on. This, these are just different prime numbers, and these are just integer powers, positive integer powers, at least, a1, a2, a3. So the number of divisors of this number, and by divisors, I mean all numbers that um, when you divide k by that number, you'll, it leaves a remainder of 0, including 1 and k. Um, the number of divides is just going to be a1 plus 1 times a2 plus 1 times a3 plus 1, and so on, until you get to the last exponent. And we can show that this is the case by just simply considering what a divisor is. Um, a number can only be a divisor if it has, um, it has the same prime factors, or its, it's, prime, it's prime factors are. Um, among p1, p2, all the way to whatever, and its exponents are all less. So we can actually sort of construct a divisor, right, in a way so that um, each of these terms that we're multiplying, they represent the number of, um, or they represent like the possible exponents of p1, p2, p3, et cetera, in the divisor. And and it's and you add one here because this is a case where there's zero or zero of that prime factor. And that's sort of theoretical. So for example, if we take a number such as 144, um, we can factor this as um, 2 to the fourth times 3 squared. And according to what we have here, there are a total of 15 factors with five, 5 times 3. And the reason why it's the case is if we take any prime factor, it'll either, it must, it can only have a two or a three, or two and three as the possible primes in its factorization. And this two can have an exponent of zero, one, two, three, or four. And this three can have an exponent of zero, one, or two. If the two has an exponent of anything else, 
then it won't be able to divide this evenly. And same thing here. So there are a total of five possible exponents here and three possible exponents here. So then there are 15 total factors. So yeah, just if you can understand how that works. Very, very cool fact. Anyway, moving on. Um, next thing I want to talk about is, oh, it's sort of simple, but it's just divisibility. And by divisibility, it's one, two, three, et cetera. Um, this is just a divisibility rule that I made for the numbers of, from one through 12 as past that you're better, you're better off just straight up trying to divide it and see, see if it works. Um, so yeah, here's the table. The, the notable ones are like, you can actually show this pretty easily as we can write any number, like if, it, if the number is just A, B, C, a three digit number A, B, C, or A, B, C are just digits, we can write this as 100A plus 10B plus C. And then we just, you just have to realize that 99A plus 9B is divisible by three. So then if you subtract that, you just, you're just left with A plus B plus C. So this has to be divisible by three if A, B, C is divisible by three. So that's why the sum of digits is divisible by three is the rule for three. And it's also the same, as, same for why it's divisible by nine as well. Anyway. Um, the, the reason why the divisibility rule for four is the last two digits is because 100 is divisible by four. So you can just subtract off any multiple of 100 from that number. So you're only left with two digits. And eight is because of 1,000. And um, yes, I am aware there is a rule for seven but I don't think it's very practical to remember. And I think you're just better off either just ignoring it or just straight up dividing as I don't even remember the rule for seven. And um, one thing that's it's not very common, but it, it is used quite often in problems of invisibility is the one with 11. And it's basically the alternating sum and difference of digits divisible by 11. So for example, if we have this number right here, 2524243. OK. So basically, for this number, we can just take the alternating sum and difference, which is like you assign every other one to be positive and every other one to be negative. So 2 minus 5 plus 4 minus 2 plus four and minus three. This is actually going to be equal to zero. So zero is divisible by 11. We have that this number is divisible by 11. And yeah, cool. Um, I think one, one cool thing to know when you're dividing, when you're finding modulus of seven, 11, and 13, it's just to know that the product of seven, 11, and 13 is 1,001. So, so if you're dealing with four digit numbers or larger, you can actually use this fact to simplify the problem by subtracting multiple, multiples of 1001. And for example, if we take this number 254243, we know that um, 11 divides 1001. So we can actually just subtract off a multiple for 1001, which is 243243. And you're left with 11,000. That's divisible by 11. So that's another way you can see that it's divisible by 11. Yes, I am aware there is a rule for seven, but I don't think it's it's useful enough to remember. So if you know it, that's great. But if you don't know it, it's also fine. All right. Okay. So our next the next thing I want to talk about ties right into divisibility, which is a modulo operation. And it, you'll see it in prompt is mod. And it basically refers to the remainder when divided by. 
And basically what that means is that um, 5 mod 3 is just equal to 2 mod 3. And the three lines equal, this three lines equal sign is used to signify modular equivalence. And basically, the most simplified version of a, a mod expression is going to be if it's k mod m, at least. This k has to be less than m, as you can always just subtract m from k if it is greater than m. And basically, if k is divisible by m, then we have that k mod m is just equal to 0 mod m. And this notation is really great when, when we only really care about aspects of a problem that don't actually involve calculating like the or this is useful when you only want the remainder and not the quotient. I thought so. Yeah. And actually and okay. This theorem involving mods is I think the most useful one and the most basic one at least called the Chinese remainder theorem. And basically it says that if we know um, the mod, mods of two different numbers, mod two different numbers of this same number k, then we can, then we can figure out there is a unique um, mod m times. Okay, so let, let me just explain better. So basically if we start with um, m and n, which are just relatively prime integers, and meaning they have no common factors, we have another number k, right? And basically, if we know that this number k, when mod m is an integer a, and mod n is an integer b, and this is just any integer a and b, then we know that there is an, a unique integer c, such that k mod mn equals to c. And this is true for any k that satisfies these first two conditions. And it is important to note that a, a times b is not necessarily equal to c. It just states that c exists and it is unique. And basically what, what this does is that in problems when you're trying to find um, the remainders when just divided by something, you can actually just um, split it into two different problems. So for example, if, if we want to find the remainder when something is divided by a thousand, we can instead find the remainder when one's divided by eight and one is divided by 125. And then you can figure out where this mod 1000, although 1000 is not a great number since it's really easy. But basically, so for example, um, it's the source right here. So let's say we have a number that five mod seven and let's say it's eight mod eleven. And basically that means that when you divide by seven you get five. We divide by eleven you get eight. And so what is the remainder when it's divided by seventy seven? And basically um there really isn't a great way to do this except for to use the Chinese remainder theorem. And that basically just states that there exists a number, and there's only one solution to this problem. So then after that, you, you, you really only can sort of test out numbers to see if it works until you get one number less than 77 that works, and then that's your answer. So in this case, you would just add a to all the multiples of 11 until you get one that is 5 mod 7. And um, I actually just made this up on the spot. Okay, so basically, if we have mod 11, so we have 11 plus 8 is 19. This is not, actually, this is 5 mod 7. Okay, we're done. Then the answer is 19. So basically, what we did is you use Chinese Reader Theorem. It's not a way to find this number C, you won't be able to find it using this theorem. You'll only be able to know that there's only one solution. And yes, the, the only way to find it is to actually just sort of guess, guess and check your way 
until you find the answer. And you can just guess and check by, by adding 8 to all the multiples of 11 until you find a number that is the same modulo 7. So, yeah. And on this topic of modular theorems, I do want to just talk about one other thing. I don't really have to know it. The quotient function. Basically, we can define um, this function as the totion of a number what is what is FLT my little theorem and last theorem hmm. I'll, I'll do those after they have time because okay because honestly like Okay, well, so I do want to cover totions at least. It's called Euler's totion theorem or function at least. And basically, this function is the number of no, number of integers less than n that are also relatively prime to n. And basically, what that means, or you can actually find this by factoring n and then just times of the reciprocal, one minus the reciprocal of all those prime factors, basically. So yeah, um, and basically the cool thing about this is that we know that for any integer that's relatively, well, not just the way, you have that x to the n or the totion of n minus one or is it just a totion? It's just the totion of it. And so that's just the cool thing that you you know, but I don't at this level I don't think it's entirely um, necessary to know. So yeah, cool stuff. I'm lagging. Okay. So, um, actually, digits, this is the next topic, is more common in AMC at least. Usually, it's just you're given some really large expression and you want to find the last the two digits, the last digit, or the hundred digit, or something. And basically, the way you can do this is either look for patterns or you can um, take the modulo of a 10 power. Basically, the unit digit of a number is just that number mod 10. Last two digits is number mod 100, etc. And you can see this because you can just remove all the digits after that. Um, that number is divisible by 10. And basically, um, I think the coolest thing about mods is that you can find a lot of lot of neat patterns. And usually, for example, if you want to find the unit digit of a number k to the n, or maybe not use digit as doesn't really matter. So let's say you want to find the unit digit of a power of seven or something. So you want to find the unit digit of seven to the seventeenth. A lot of times, especially with these numbers, you can actually just list out the unit digits as seven, nine, three, one, seven. And you'll see that they'll always you always eventually find a repeat as as basically you'll find that there's always going to be a pattern of some length and four it's usually it's usually four but sometimes it's two and once once you know this you can simply just find what this number is mod the length of the cycle which is four which is one and then you can just take the um, number that is in that place in the cycle. So we know the unit digit of 7 to the 17th is just 7. And this works with not just um, unit digits, but it also works with mods as well. 
So if, instead, if we want seven, seven is not a good number. Let's say we want uh, five to 17, five to 17. Let's say you want it mod three or something. So there you go, you'll find that um, with mods, there are only a finite number of possible mods this can be, as in zero, one, and two. So then we can actually just um, write this as a pattern again. So we have five to the one is two mod three. Five squared is going to be one mod three. And then 5 cubed, which is 125, that's going to be 2 mod 3. So you'll see that, again, there's a pattern, which is alternate 1, 2. And since it's odd, it's going to be 2 mod 3. And basically, these are just examples of what I'm trying to say. And what I'm just trying to say is that when, when we're dealing with large exponents, just list out what it is for smaller exponents and look for a pattern, depending on what the exponent's value is. And you'll see this later in problems, in the problems. So don't worry about it too much. The next thing I want to talk about is the greatest common divisor and least common multiple. And basically, the GCD of two numbers is the largest number that evenly divides both of them. And on the contrary, for the least common multiple, it's the largest number that both numbers divide. And basically, the only thing you need to know is that the greatest common divisor and least common multiple, when you multiply them together, is going to be the product of these two numbers. So if we have, for example, 6 and 8, the GCD of them is going to be 2. The LCM of them is going to be 24. And the, as then the product is going to be 48, which is exactly 6 times 8. So yeah, there is one problem involving them, although it's yes, least common multiple. Oh yeah, my bad. Don't worry about that. It's the smallest number that they both divide, not the largest, because then that would be sort of infinite. But yeah, cool. Intuitively, that makes more sense, doesn't it? Anyway. OK. Moving on, because this really isn't explored too much anyway. Bases. Um, bases is basically just a way we can write numbers. And normally, we write in base 10, meaning that every place value is going to be worth a power of 10. And in different bases, this is going to be different. So we write an, a, di a number in base k. It's basically just these digits, and you'll usually see the parentheses, or maybe not parentheses, just um, a subscript of k after it, like 1012. That, that just means 101 in base 2. And basically, each of these numbers is just going to be similar to how we write things in our system. It's going to be the value of this digit, then times the value of the place. And then you just add them all up for every single digit. And each place value is just going to be um, this base to a certain exponent. So actually, if we go back to example 101 base 2, it's going to be 1 times 2 to 0, as this is the, you can think of it as the 1 place. Then this, this one's just going to be 0 times 2 to the 1. And because in base 10, this would be times 10 to the 1. And then this one is going to be plus 1 times 2 squared, and so on. So basically, we have that each, that the product, or the, or basically each place value is going to be a factor of 2 less than the next one. And when we, when we have um, numbers that, or when we have decimals in different bases, we simply just write them as negative exponents. Like 0 0.3 is 3 times 10 to the negative 1. So 0 0.1 in base 2 is just going to be 1 times 2 to the negative 1, or 1 half. So yeah, that's how, that's how the bases work. And 
you can just think of it as writing it in base 10 and then just just making the place values with a different number other than 10. And the, the really one restricting property in base in a base is that every digit in that number for it to be a valid number at least must be less than the base. So for example, in base 10, our largest digit is nine. And if we have 10, we simply just carry it over to the next digit. And, and usually the largest base that you'll see is 16, which is hexadecimal. And because that it's larger than 10, we need separate digits to represent the values of 10 through 15. And usually the letters A through F are used to represent 10 through 15 respectively. So A is usually 10 and F is 15 and everything in between just matches up. Yes. So um, general tips for these kind of problems is just, um, honestly, just see what you need to do. And it's, it's really just figure out what to do. It's, there's really not, not that many tips for it. So yeah, simplify the problem and work, work from there. There can be sort of diverse. So, um, on to the problems. I'm not sure if you guys have a. I'm not sure if you guys have done any of these yet, so we'll start with. I'll give you like a minute just to look at them. So yeah, especially like these two. This these are sort of like the easy ones, so. I'm going to give you like a minute or two just to look at them and send me an answer when you are done with them. Okay, basically just work, work on these two problems and in about one or two minutes I'll go over them. Okay. A little bit of technical difficulty here, don't worry about it. Huh. Okay, well. Anyway, so I have gotten a few solutions for um, each of the problems. So for the first problem, how many positive integers n does 1 plus 2 plus all the way to n even if you write 6n? So basically this wants us to find 6n over how many, how many integers n is this going to be a positive integer? 
And um, first, what you should know is that the sum can be factored into n times n plus 1 over 2. And there are actually a lot of ways to show this. But you can really just pair up n and n, n 1, n minus 1, n 2, et cetera, until you get to the middle. And yeah, that's sort of why it works. So when we simplify this fraction, you'll get that this is equal to 12 over n plus 1. And simply, we just need to find the number of n plus 1 that divide by 12, that divide 12, or the number of factors of 12, right? So 12 is just 2 squared times 3. So um, that's 3 times 2, which equals to 6. However, we want positive integers n, so n can't equal to 0. And since 1 is also one of these 6, you have to subtract it off. You're just left with 5 of them that work. And if we list them out, they're just n equals to 1, 2, 3, 5, and 11. So yeah. <clears throat> Next problem is like k equals to this, whatever this is, we want to find the unit digit of k squared plus 2 to the k, right? So, first off, when we, when we find unit digit, so we can actually just turn this into 8 squared plus 2 to 2008 because these, this 2000 in front of it will not affect what the unit digit is of actually of k because actually that's, that's, that's wrong i mean this problem it doesn't it doesn't matter but another problem it might never mind sorry about that okay so first we want to find usage of this so what does that mean we need to find usage of k and we also need to find usage of well two to the k and we can find the usage of k now we know the usage of 2008 squared, this unit is going to be 4 because 8 squared is 64, and the 2000 part doesn't matter. So now we, we really just need to find the usage of this 2 to 2008 and 2 to the k. And if you notice that they're sort of similar, because they are, we can just use this thing right here and simply find a pattern, right? So if we look for the unit digits, of the powers of 2, you have that 2 to the 1 is 2, 2 squared is 4, 2 cubed is 8, and 2 to the 4th is 16, so 6. And then once you go to 2 to the 5th, you're left back at 2, and then 4, 8, 6, etc. So we have that all the powers of 2 single digit, they repeat every four numbers. And you know, 2008 mod 4 is going to be 0. And in this case, this is 1, 2, 3, 4. Right, and zero refers to four. So we know the unit digit of two to two thousand eight is just six. So that means that the unit digit of um, k is just going to be zero. So this part is just zero, as k squared is also going to be zero. So now we're left with two to the k, and since we know k is this number, and this number is divisible by four, as Four divides this obviously, and 2008 is even, and even squared is divisible by four. So we know that k is divided by four. So two to the k also has a unit digit of six. So the unit digit of this thing, k squared plus two to the k, the unit digit is zero, and this is six. So we're just left with six. Voila. Um, before we go on, I I did get a. I did get a comment about uh, Fermat's little theorem and last theorem, and I guess I do want to touch upon it a little bit. No, not really. Basically, um, from, these are just common theories in them, or very um, well known ones at least. Fermat's last theorem and little theorem. And honestly, the last theorem is not really that useful here, at least. Well, it's the little theorem is, it just states that for any prime number and any number a, I don't, I don't think an a can be divisible by the prime, at least. It's a to the p minus 1, any a, basically.
like that. So for any prime p and any a not divisible by p, you have a to the p minus one is one mod p. I'm not sure, I don't know how to prove this. Okay, not yet. So yeah, if you're interested, that's little theorem. And last theorem just states that um, if we have the equation a to the n plus b to the n equals to c to the n, there are no positive integer solutions for a, b, and c if n is greater than two. And obviously, for n equals two and one, you'll just have this is the Pythagorean theorem and a plus b equals c. So the last theorem just says that if if n is three, four, or greater, it's never going to work. And that's the interesting theorem again. It's not that useful in these problems, but it's cool to know. So yeah. Anyway, back to where we were. Uh, this problem, uh, Yashi. You need the binomial theorem for this binomial theorem for this problem. So if you don't know it, that sort of sucks. And basically, I'm not gonna. This this is one of the problems I probably should not put on here, but I'm doing it anyway. So basically, the idea behind this problem is you want to find the hundredth digit of this, which means that you want to find 2011 to 2011 mod 1000. And if you realize this, um, this 2000 part, it's not relevant at all because well it. It doesn't contribute anything to hundred digit, so we just have that this is equivalent to eleven to two thousand eleven mod one thousand, and you can just change this to ten plus one to the two thousand eleven mod one thousand, and then you can use the binomial theorem from there to actually figure out figure out what it is, and. So yeah, I'm not really going to solve this problem as I didn't really manage the binomial theorem. So yeah, if if you do know, you can finish the problem, but I don't actually expect to be able to get this. So yeah, interesting to work on if you have more time. Moving on. Right, so this is a base problem, and this and this is just because this really just tests you if you know what a base is, and the number of 2013 is ending in a digit three. And then base nine, it's this thingy. This is just an example, it's really not relevant. So basically we're asked how many positive integers B is there, are there, so that the base B representation of 2013 ends in the digit three. So, so really what you need, to, you need to realize is that if it ends in digit three, that must mean that it's a remainder when you divide it by B is equal to three. And this is because any number, if it's like A, B, C, D, E, F, three, base B, we have that, this is our number 2013 or something, right? We have that A, B, C, D, E, F, they're all multiplied by B to the one, B squared, et cetera. So this part is all divisible by B, and which just leaves a three. So we just need to find the number of numbers such that, 2013 mod B is equal to 3. Well, there is another. And after that, okay. So basically, what this means is that we know that 2010 mod B is equal to 0. So from here, all we have to do is find the number of factors of 2010. And, um, okay, you have your hand raised. Give me a mic. This thing is sort of slow to respond, unfortunately. Uh, yes, so would you like to solve the problem? Yeah, so I was, I actually, so using modular, modular arithmetic, we know that uh, whatever, so we need to find the numbers where um, it's, div it's it leaves a remainder of three, and those are all the factors of 2010. I believe you already said this, but so the way you find the factors of 2010 is five times two times three times 67. 
I think if I'm right. And then if you, if you, yeah. And then if you add one to each of the exponents, you'll get 16. Are we done? Is this the answer? For how many base positives? Uh, um, the representation. Well, base, does base one count? I don't think so, right? Nope, it does not. So, so uh, right? As, well, do you realize that this number must have every digit is less than K, right? And we know that three must be a digit here. So actually the subtract three of the bases because one, two, and three are all factors of 2010, but none of them will work because they oh, can't well, because they must be less than base system. All right, so then it would be 13. So right, it's actually 16 million. So yeah, that's like the one caveat with base problems. You have to sort of be careful. That's that's basically it. Be careful about be careful that um it actually works, as in none of the digits are actually greater than the base. After that, you're okay. Okay. Don't don't worry about messing up too much. Although it can be a problem basically. Honestly, the only way to prove is to rec recognize why you're messing up and just don't make the same mistake twice. That's really it. If you're making the same mistake over and over again, then it really is not working. You just have to pay attention to why you're messing up. And it's not, not just talking up to, oh, I'm, I'm not, just not like thinking right. It's just. You just have to be careful, and there's really no other, other like explanation. Anyway, and this thing didn't load. So basically, um, what this problem is supposed to say, if I remember correctly, at least, what is the greatest factor of? Actually, give me a minute. I can I can load this problem up real quick. I believe. You know, okay. Well, we'll skip this one for now. I don't want to. I don't want to look it up right now. Okay. An integer n is selected at random in the range this. So we want the probability that the remainder when divided by five is one. And again, we you notice this is a rather large exponent. We can just um, simply just do sort of case work on what the on uh, what n mod 5 is, and then just find out what that means for n to a larger powers. So if n is equal to 0 mod 5, then this is always going to be 0 mod 5, no matter what power n is. If n is 1, then n, then any power of n is always going to be 1 mod 5, as you'll find that it just, you'll, you'll just keep on multiplying by 1. So you're just be left of one. And if you have two, or if n is two mod five, you have n squared is going to be four mod five. Then you have n cubed is going to be eight mod five, which is the same as three mod five. And n to the fourth is going to be six mod five or one mod five. And then you're just going to be left with one, and then it's going to repeat over and over again like that two, four, three, one, etc. So n to the 16th is just going to be 1 mod 5, as 16 is divided by 4, and this is the 4th tenth. And we have for 3 and 4, we have that 3 um, works just very similarly to um, 2. And you'll just be left, this is 1 mod 5 as well. And the same thing with 4, it's going to alternate 4, 1, 4, 1, like that. And again, since it's even, it's also going to be 1 mod 5. So basically, you'll find that if n is 1, 2, 3, or 4 mod 5, n to the 16th is always going to be 1 mod 5. And if n is 0 mod 5, then it's just going to be 0 mod 5. So if you notice that it's this range, 1 to 20, 20, it is, well, it contains every single mod equal number of times. So the probability is just going to be 4 fifths because there are four possible ones that end in one and one that ends in zero, and that's it.
والله اوكي نيكست بوم نمبر 21 فاكتوريال از فيري بيج اند هاز ا لوت اوف فاكتورز اور ديفايسز رايت And basically, we know that, actually, you know what, to just read the prompt. We know that um, out of all these integer divisors, one of them is chosen at random, and we want the probability that it is odd. So how do we go about such a problem? So basically, um, when, you, when you're left with this kind of problem, you notice that, well, this is very big. There's really no way you're going to be able to list out what all the factors are or anything like that. The first thing you realize is how do you even get these divisors? We get, we get these divisors by multiplying 1 plus all of these exponents. So if we let the exponent of the 2 be x and y and so on, it should be f plus 1, uh, y plus 1, and so on, right? And you'll realize that this is, it's, evenly, it's evenly divided so that for each power of 2, if you have, we have that um, there are an equal number of divisors with a factor of 2 to the 0, a factor of 2 to the 1, a factor of 2 squared, all the way to a factor of 2 to the x. And this is really because if we can, if we divide by 20 fa 21 factorial by all of its factors of 2, then we'll be left with some number. And we can take all the divisors of this number, and then we multiply by one of these factors of 2, and we get all the factors of 21 factorial. So basically, all you have to do is find the, find x, find the number of powers of 2 in 21 factorial, and then the probability is just going to be 1 over x plus 1. As basically the case where you get 2 to 0 instead of any of these other numbers. Right? So you really just want to find a number of factors of 2 in 21 factorial, and you know that 21 factorial is just 21 times 20 times 19 all the way to 1. And yeah simple counting from here on out. So a cool way to do this is that you know that there are 10, 10 numbers divisible by 2, and then plus yeah, 5 numbers that are divisible by 4, and then 2 numbers divisible by 8, 1 number divisible by 15, so that's with 18 factors of 2, so your probability is just 1 19. But now why does this method work, where we have Basically, this is the floor of 21 over 2 plus the floor of 21 over 4 plus the floor of 21 over 8 plus the floor of 21 over 16. And this can be a number of factors of 2. And basically, the, way this, the, the reason why this works is you first count all the, all the ones that are divisible by 2. And when you're doing this, you, you think of it as removing a a factor of two from all these numbers, so that now all the ones that are divisible by four are now only divisible by two. So once you count these that are divisible by four, they're gone, and the ones that are divisible by eight are now only left with one factor of two, and so on, until you get to the largest power of two less than well, your largest number. So yeah, if you're not really convinced, you can actually just, since 21 isn't that big, you can actually just count um, just straight up. But yeah, you'll find that there are 18 factors of 2, so probably just 119. Cool. And basically, if you're wondering, this is actually just called That I don't know how you pronounce it. Lagrange's formula, 
and it's basically just the number of ways to find the the number of factors of a certain prime within a uh, number of factorial. So you can you can look it up. It's quite intuitive. So yeah, someone was mentioning it earlier too. Anyway, next problem. You have that for some positive integer k, then this expression in base k, oh, this expression in base k is going to be 751, and we want to find what is k. So as mentioned earlier, when we have a thing after a decimal point, we can treat it as just negative exponents or a fraction. So really what this is, is just 2 over k plus 3 over k squared plus 2 over k cubed plus 3 over k to the fourth, etc. And this is really just the sum of two infinite geometric series where we have um, two, 2 over k, 2 over k cubed, and the common difference is 1 over k squared, and you have 3 over k squared plus 3 over k to the fourth, plus, and so on. Right? Basically, um, well, there are a few ways you can do this. Um, if, you, if, if you were here last class, or two classes ago, I'm not sure, you can just write this as um, the first term over 1 minus the common difference. Or common ratio so is just two over k over one minus one over k to one minus one over k squared. And if we simplify this, this is just two k plus three all over um, k squared minus one. This is skipping a few steps, but this just this just simplifies down to here, and we can set that equal to seven over fifty one. And after that, all you have to do is just simply cross multiply and use the quadratic formula. So, I mean, on, on the real AMC 10, you can just simply plug in the answer choices for k until you get get it works. But in this case, since I removed all the answer choices, we actually have to uh, cross multiply. So we have 102 k plus 153 is equal to 7k squared minus 7. So 7k squared minus 102k minus 160 equals to 0. And for that formula. Any, anyway. I'll save you some work. You will end up getting this is 102 plus or minus 122 all over 14. And then the only solution that works from here is the positive one. And you'll just be left with 16 as your answer. So, yeah. Basically, anytime you see a repeating expression behind a decimal point, always think in the geometric series. After that, you're basically set. So, yeah. Um, one more problem and challenge problem. So we have 19 factorial is this number right here. I want to find T, M, and H, uh, which are the basically missing digits within these factorials. I want to find the sum. That's your policy. Yes. Anyway, um, well, there are actually a few ways you can do this. The first one is you can actually just multiply out 90 factorial, and eventually you'd actually get the answer. But that way, it's sort of prone to a bit of a you can make a lot of mistakes. Now we're sort of running out of time, so I just wanted to go over this problem real fast. Okay. But anyway, so um, this is where we use this cool thing called divisibility rule. To find digits, I didn't spell that right. First, we have that 90 factorial has three factors of five, 5, 10, and 15. 
so we know it has to end in three zeros, which means that h is equal to zero. Next, we can use um, divisibility by nine, because it's stronger than divisibility by three, to find that one plus two plus one plus six plus t plus five plus one plus four plus m plus eight plus three plus two must be divisible by nine. And uh, if you add this, it's 4, 10, 15, 16, 20, 28, um, 31, 33. 33 plus t plus m must be divisible by 9. So then we, we can simplify that to t plus m is 3 minus 9. And basically, we know that t and m are digits. so. The max, the max that T and M can be is just, or this can just be three, or so T, T plus M can either be three or 12, basically, as it can't equal to 21, as T and M are both less than 10, and they can't be negative. So that's cool. So next, um, we can use 11, where we have one plus two, sorry, not plus two, minus two. One minus two plus one minus six plus t minus five plus one minus zero plus zero minus four plus zero minus m plus eight minus three plus two and so on. And um, if we calculate this, this cancels out here. This is a minus eleven, so we can ignore it. This is a plus one. This is a minus three. It's plus five. Um, plus two, four. Right. Uh, where was I? So basically we have that T minus M, if I calculate it right, if I, if I calculate it right, because I'm doing this all mentally, T minus M, I believe this is a plus four, four. Then it was not. So you have one minus two plus one, that's zero. Minus six, six minus five, negative eleven, negative ten, negative fourteen, negative six, negative nine, negative seven. So t minus m minus seven is divided by eleven. So t minus m is just seven mod eleven. Right? So this must mean that t minus m is either going to be seven, but it's going to be negative four. And we, we can basically narrow down these two numbers because any other um, value that works, such as 18, is going to be too big for t minus m, and similarly for negative, um, whatever, negative 15. So now we just have these two so now we just have uh, these two things where t plus m is equal to 3 or 12, and t minus m is equal to 7 or negative 4. And so basically, there are, basically four, there are only four cases that are possible, and the only one that actually works, if you check it, is t plus m equals 12, and t minus m equals to negative 4. And this is the only one that gives integer value, positive integer values of t and m, which are actually just 4 and 8. So you'll find that we only want t plus m plus h, which is just 12 plus 0 is 12. So we're done. OK. Uh, last problem is the challenge problem. Honestly, the hint is, well, first the hint is, well, utilize the concept of what GCD is to factor a, b, c, and d. First, we know that a must be divisible by 24. So a is 2 cubed times 3 times some number x, let's say. b must be divisible by 24 and by 36. So we take the largest factors of 2 and 3 from each. So b must be divisible by 2 cubed times 3 squared, right, times some number y. And same with c and d. C must do by 54 and 36, so it must be divided by um, 2 cubed times 
I'll do it take you. Not take you. Sorry. Two squared times three cubed times some number W, I guess. And D must be must be divided by fifty four, which is just two times three cubed times Z. So now we want we know the GCD of D and A are between seventy and one hundred. Is between seven and one hundred, and we also want to find what must also be the divisor of A. This suggests that there's probably only one possible value of GCD of DNA that's between seventy and one hundred from these answer choices. And I had to leave these here because that's really the only way you can solve the problem. And um, yeah, it's D. So yeah, I guess we're not going to be leaving this open ended this week. Basically. We have that x and z, they both cannot have a factor of 2 and 3, because if they did, then the GCDs of a, b, and here, c, d, they would be different. For example, if z was, for example, if um, a, for, if x is divisible by 2, or, actually, that matter. So no, if x is divisible by 3, for example, then this GCD right here would have an extra multiple of three and so on. So basically what this means is that um, the GCD of A and D must equal to whatever is here, two and three, two times three times some other number, P. P is actually not necessarily prime, but it's like P like that. And the only number in the answer choices that leave this between 70 and 100 is 13. That's our answer, because 6 times 13 is 78, and 6 times 17 is going to be 102, this is 66. They're both out of range, so D is the answer. Voila. It wasn't challenging, but that's why it wasn't super challenging. That's why I solved it here. I just had to have some sort of challenge. Okay. Anyway, um, class is over, so you are welcome to leave now.